Hello guys, welcome back to the Henry Holster shop. It's Saturday evening. This is episode 30 of Holster Life. There's really is kind of, I think there's kind of a missing episode. Um, but tonight we're talking about tools. So as usual, if you are a holster company, please post your company name in the comments so I can keep track of who's who. I got my fancy hat with wings on tonight. I'm really psyched up because my first employee starts full time on Monday. My sister Maureen is here, Gary Gonzalez is here, hi G&G Tactical, thank you for stopping by. Uh, I have the Brother Mill power down for the evening, it's going to serve as an example in my video, and then when I'm done with the video, I'm going to go ahead and turn it back on and make some more stuff. Um, the topic tonight is really broad. Hi Jerry Thompson, uh, is Mrs. Thompson watching also, is your accountant tuning in? Hi Brett Pittman, Jim Ryan, Tough Tech's in the house, hello Matthew Bills. Uh, Matthew, did you get that package yet or is it still in transit? Sean's here, Randy Stevenson, Stephen Oliveira, what's up, Stephen? And my first name is Andrew, not Henry, so if you say what's up, say what's up, Andrew. MK Tech Holsters is here for a bit, Todd May, one of my regulars. Thank you for stopping by again, Todd. I appreciate you taking your time to watch on a Saturday evening. So, the topic is tools. I'm going to get right into it. Since the topic is tools, there's no point in a tool tip. Hello, Aaron. Uh, by the way, Aaron, I'm curious how that fume hood over your heat press is working uh, to cut down the Kydex fumes you were complaining about. Hi, Jessica Haslar. Good to talk to you again today. Um, thank you, Stephen. What's up, Stephen? Um, so basically, there are some, some general categories I think about when I'm thinking about tools, uh, either tools that I have for the business, tools I'm thinking about buying for the business, tools that I see in other businesses. I'm going to move the camera a little closer so I don't have to lean in as much. Oh, I'm at the limit of my power cord. Um, works awesome, says Aaron. That's great. I'll take away the ridiculous wings. Thank you. This is one of my favorite hats. It's fleece lined. It's a wool hat. It's super cozy. And then in the winter, when I wear my respirator, it keeps the straps from digging into me. And I can wear the respirator for a long period of time and still remain pretty comfortable. So the topic is tools. Hi, Aaron McGinnis. And I'm going to give you guys a little picture into how I think about tools in my business. And then some recommendations for what tools I think you should consider if you don't have them already. And how to go about prioritizing what tools you spend your money on. So first thing is, a tool in your shop is anything that helps you to do the job better faster, more consistently, at a higher level of quality. This Brother CNC mill is a tool. This mechanical pencil is a tool. Basically anything in the shop that I use is a tool. And the purpose of the tools is to increase the speed at which I can consistently produce the highest quality product at the price point that I sell. And all those things factor in, like it would make if I was making widgets that sold for a nickel a piece, if I was going to spend a half a million dollars on a tool to make the widgets, I'm going to have to make a ridiculous number of widgets, tens of millions of widgets. Um, if I'm looking at a tool that costs $100, if it's going to save me any significant hassle at all, any, $100 is chump change. So earlier today, I bought a tool that I've been planning to buy for a long time, and I kept putting off and kept putting off and kept putting off. And every time I had to do a job that needed that tool and I didn't have that tool, I kicked myself a little bit. So a few videos ago, I uh, uh, said a quote from Henry Ford. He said, if you need a tool or a machine, if you need a machine and you don't buy it, you will find later that you have paid for it and don't have it. And the concept there is that you're always paying either with cash or with time and that buying tools is a trade-off. It's an arbitrage. It's an exchange. You are giving up cash to get back time to make more cash. And so the tool I bought today is a 52-inch uh, floor-mounted sheet metal shear because currently I score and crack all my 4 by 8 foot sheets of Kydex and then usually use a bandsaw, or in some cases I have plywood templates, depending on the size I'm cutting, uh, to cut down my plastic to the sizes I need to put on the Swift press or to put in my side vacuum former. And uh, what a 
what a sheet metal shear will do for me is allow me to set a guide, slide a sheet in, stomp the pedal, nice clean cut. It will be faster, it will be more repeatable, and it will make less mess in my shop. Scoring and cracking doesn't make a big mess. Running codex on the bandsaw does make a mess. And after I run it on the bandsaw, before I put it in the heat press, I have to take a deburring tool and quickly swipe the fuzz off the edge that I bandsaw cut. Otherwise, that stuff gets in the, in the heat press and can stick to later pieces of codex and be kind of a problem. And so the sheet metal shear is going to eliminate one whole step, which is the deburring the edge. There'll be none of that. It will reduce the mess and therefore save me time on cleanup in the shop. And it will also increase my speed. To me, it's a no-brainer. The only thing that it held me back was the sheer dollar amount. I think I spent about $1,300 to get it shipped here. Um, I bought that tool today, and I'm sure that before very much time has gone by, that tool will more than pay for itself. It looks a little bit like my comments have frozen. I can't tell if that's the case or if you guys are all just being quiet this evening. So when I think about a tool... Tom Crawford is back. Blade Tech is in the house. Hello, Tom. Thank you for watching. Hi, John. Hello, Jefferson Brooks. Uh, while you're here, I've got 35 people watching right now. I would really appreciate it if you would share the feed. Um, I, I enjoy spending time talking about the things that impact my business and sharing what information I can that's useful to all of you. I would appreciate it if uh, on your end you would also share the feed so that the information I put out and the time that I spend and invest into this would be able to go out to other people as well. Hello, Chris. Hi, Justin Willis. Hello, Tony Katner. Um, and so one of the basic, the basic cost benefit of a tool is, is it going to save me enough time and or increase my quality or consistency enough that it will pay for itself in an estimable time frame? Like this machine makes money, but it takes a while for a machine like this to pay for itself. I'm not rolling in money. I didn't pay cash for all of this. And so I have a loan on this machine. Thank you, Jefferson, for watching. I appreciate your being here. Um, and so with this machine, with this tool, and all the other little tools, the, the cutters and the everything else that goes into running this thing, vices, vacuum clamping, end mills, probes, tool holders, pull studs, all that jazz. Um, that tool is gradually paying for itself. It's not, um, it's not the case that you buy the tool, use it once, and it's done. I mean, there are some tools that pay for themselves super quickly. Like... Um, what would be a good example? A drill press. I had a conversation months and months ago with Shane Muse. And Shane was saving up money to try to upgrade some tools. Hello, Brian Rector. He was saving money to upgrade some tools, and he was trying to think through which tools to buy first. Hello, Gundo Holsters. And so he was looking at uh, a drill press and a bandsaw, because he was using a hand drill and he was using a scroll saw. And between those two, he was thinking that he should go uh, bandsaw first. So if he had 500 bucks saved up, spend it on a bandsaw, continue to use the hand drill, and then save up the next round of money for a drill press. And when I actually thought about what he was spending time on, um, I actually encouraged him to go the other way, and it was my recommendation that he buy the drill press first. My chair wheels are off the mat, and I'm rocking around better. Um, yeah, I think the sheet metal shear is going to be a big help, Ben Miller. I process a lot of 4 by 8 foot sheets, and the reason I don't currently have a lot of custom sizes cut for me by either index or knife kits um, is because when I'm doing OEM work, I have to have flexibility and the quantities my customers need often change month to month. And so I don't want to tie up huge amounts of money in lots and lots and lots of pre-cut sheets 
uh, especially when it's sort of incumbent on my client to go out and sell more of the parts I'm producing in bulk for him or her. Um, so for me, the sheet metal shear, buying the stuff full size and using a sheet metal shear in my shop to quickly punch it down to whatever sizes I need that day is the most affordable way for me to keep enough inventory on hand that I can fulfill any reasonable size order uh, without excessive plastic waste, but without having to deal with anybody else's lead time when it comes to ordering custom cuts. I don't know how many of you have ordered custom cuts. Um, it's not always as fast as ordering full-size sheets. And when I've got full-size sheets, if I've got 10 4 by 8 foot sheets left and I'm going through one sheet a day, I know when I'm going to run out. I can plan ahead. I can purchase more in advance and make sure to have it here so I don't run out. Michael Hallam is in the house. Welcome, Michael. And so the sheet metal shear for me buys me flexibility. And that flexibility is a huge asset to me because I make a bunch of different size parts with different size molds for a bunch of different bunch of different companies. Custom cuts was four weeks for me. Basic black quota was two weeks. So yeah, if you if you have enough capital to afford to buy, if so if you're just making your own parts in your shop and you have total control over the size of the molds and all the equipment, whatever vacuum form you're using, heat source you're using, all that, then custom cuts are a pretty economical way for you to save yourself labor because most of the companies that offer, offer custom cuts are doing them. How many tacos you can do off of 4 by 8 Hard to say, Aaron. It depends. Rarely do I cut up one 4x8 and use the entire sheet all for identically sized tacos. Um, currently, if I'm doing pairs, I'll usually nest two tacos into a 10 by 15 or 10 by 16 inch piece. So do the math. Um, but for me, because I need this, I need to change sizes so often, um, custom cuts would either require me to stock oversized cuts and waste plastic every time I use them just to have an oversized cut that was on the safe side for most of my projects, or it would require me to specify a bunch of different, uh, cut sizes and then have to keep track of which ones I needed for each project and make sure to anticipate the quantities of that size in advance and reorder my custom cuts in enough time to not run out of any of them. To me, the administrative hassle of dealing with that is more of a problem than just taking a fresh 4 by 8 foot sheet to, my, to a big sheet metal shear and cutting it up into the exact sizes I need that day. And so, I prefer to have my plastic in inventory and not be waiting on anybody else. It gives me all the flexibility I want. If I decide, you know, if my plan was to spend all day milling molds and CAD is not just, just not cooperating with me that day, and I decide to just change my plan and instead spend the rest of the day just forming shells, um, I have the flexibility to do that. I've got all the material I need. I've got the molds. I just go form stuff. So the, the size I use for a pair at 10 by 8 is marginally larger than an 8 by 8. So I'm not getting, I'm not getting 72-ish. What are you doing with your heat gun, says John Hopman. Well, um, the thing I most commonly use my heat gun for these days, John, is when I'm going to put on my respirator, I take out my heat gun and I sort of warm the respirator up just so I'm not putting that cold rubber thing over my mouth, over my face. Um, I find that uh, just a little bit, it's, it's sort of like having uh, heated seats in your car. Warming up your respirator gently with a heat gun on low so it's like a nice warm thing that you put on your face, it's actually quite nice. Um, scroll back through some comments. 
Matthew Bill says, Orion, don't get the Shark HD4. Apparently somebody asked about what uh, CNC to get. We'll talk about CNCs as tools a little bit later. Um, and so I was talking with Jess Hazelar, who's here watching the feed from Eclipse Holsters today, and we were talking about using trim molds on a router table. And I think there's a misconception about this, and I want to clear it up. Maybe, maybe all of you understand it perfectly. Maybe I'm just imagining this, but I wanted to at least take a shot at it. So saving speed in the overall production of a part is, not, is often not primarily dependent on doing the existing steps faster by getting tools that allow you to do the same steps only faster. Oftentimes the speed comes in by purchasing tools that allow you to eliminate whole steps. And that's what trim routing does. Trim routing is not significantly faster than bandsaw cutting. As a matter of fact, if you're an ace with a bandsaw, you can probably cut faster than you can safely run a shell with a trim jig on a router table. The difference is, the difference is, if you run it on a router table with a trim jig, when you're done, you are consistently at exactly the same line, exactly the same profile every single time. Which means if you have verified once that your trim mold produces exactly the shell profile you want and that you've got full clearance around your magazine release, that you've got you know, clearance for your finger when you get your full firing grip that you're not rubbing Kydex right there on the side of your finger, that consistency is time. Because every time I have to take it to a sander and take a real gun or a blue gun with me and sand a spot and then lay the gun in and look at it and check and then sand a spot, lay the gun in and check, I'm throwing away time on an extra step that doesn't need to be there. And so the consistency gets me peace of mind, it gets me lower stress, and it eliminates the sanding step. I never, ever sand stuff that I've trimmed with a CNC or on a trim mold. The whole point is get the trim mold set up so that there's no adjustment necessary. And that also saves mess and it's better for your health. Sanding makes a lot of nasty dust. If I can avoid sanding plastic in my shop, I will. So Zane's got it exactly right. Consistency is what I'm going for. Um, hand drill versus drill press. You can drill a hole through .08 Kydex just as fast with a hand drill as you can with a drill press. The difference is you'll probably have more fatigue if you're doing hundreds of holes, big batch of holsters, holding up the weight of the drill and lining it up all those times is more of an issue, but you'll also have higher consistency with the drill press. If you're trying to drill a square hole through a flat piece of Dex, say you're on the wing of an outside the waistband, you've got a little jig, so you've got a block under your drill bit that the wing lays flat on the rest of the holster angles down here. You're getting a nice clean drill angle through that face. Um, the consistency saves you time. Zane asks, if I'm not sanding, do I still buff my edges? Yes, I do still buff my edges. I use a, a flap wheel on an adjustable speed bench grinder to break the sharp corners and take out the routing tool marks. Um, I have some things that I still do occasionally on a trim jig on my router table just because I'm usually making them one at a time every once in a while and it's not worth stopping whatever's running on the CNC and changing out what's on it to trim one. So I still have some things I do on my router table, although not very frequently anymore. And I do always buff the entire edge around after I trim routed on the router table to make sure those tool marks are out and that the sharp corners at the top and bottom of the edge that I've just trimmed, that those are those edges are broken and softened. So trim routing is not a substitute for buffing, but it should, in almost every case, be a really good substitute for sanding. You shouldn't have to do any cleanup shaping of the part if your trim jigs are set up correctly. And so that's a tool that buys you time by deleting an entire step out of the process. Zane says, I have a CNC, but I'm having a hard time setting up to use to route my pieces for consistency. 
Yeah, Zane, that's not especially surprising. Um, the idea that a CNC is magic, and once you get one, trimming your parts will just be easy, and you know, light will shine from heaven, and butterflies will be fluttering through the shop, and your CNC will trim all the parts and then package them for you. Um, CNC is a lot more work than I think most people who haven't tried it realize. And until they've tasted it, it's easier to think the grass is greener on the CNC side. And depending on what you're doing, it can be. But it's not the case that I would always recommend that every holster shop get in-house CNC. I don't think it's a requirement. Um, I think some shops are well suited to it and have people already in the shop who would have the natural aptitude to learn it and run it well. But there are other shops that I look at their work and I think you're doing a good job now. CNC would be more hassle for you than it would be worth. It would bring more hassles than benefits. You have to like to eat grass with CNC, says Jim Ryan. Finally catching you live, says Brent Hickman. Haven Defense Gear is here. Hello, Mr. Hickman. Thank you for joining. Since you're finally here, you can finally share the feed. And so when I evaluate tools, I try to quantify. It doesn't have to be exact, but I try to quantify at some level what it will save me versus what it will cost me. Uh, what will it cost me in terms of floor space? Does it have the potential to disrupt my workflow? Um, how often will I actually use it? How much setup time and work will it take to get it set up, get ready each time I need to use it? If I use it once a month and it takes four hours to set up, that is something I have to factor in. If I use it every day and it takes 10 seconds to set up, that's a different thing. Like my drill press, I use every single day. How long does it take to change a drill bit? Not long. How long does it change to how long does it take to change out the jig that's on the drill press table? Not long. And so that machine, you know, even though I almost I have to change it over multiple times a day, um, the changeovers are so quick and so little hassle that it doesn't make any significant impact on my overall day. Changing over jobs on this machine is a little more complicated. Like going from plastic to aluminum machining on this machine involves a whole bunch of cleanup and shop vacuuming out the plastic and wiping stuff down and then topping off my coolant and doing whatever else I need to do before I run the aluminum parts. Uh, it also involves usually changing out a bunch of the carbide cutters that are in there because I have different sets of tools for plastic work versus aluminum work. It's not the kind of thing where I'm going to run plastic all day and then cut one aluminum thing and go right back to plastic. Because once I go to cutting aluminum, I'm spraying coolant all around the inside of the machine. The entire inside of the machine is soaked afterwards. If I go in there and cut plastic right away, I'm just going to glue the plastic chips all over the inside of the machine. Gross. So understanding what the tools do, what they can realistically save you, what they will cost you in terms of cash, in terms of time, in terms of maintenance, in terms of space, 53 holsters in eight hours to Zane. Those seem like awfully solid numbers to me, man. If, you, if you're charging a reasonable price for those holsters and making some good margin on them, that is really well done. Hello, Tyler. Things are pretty well here. And so uh, one of the other things I said I was going to talk about is saving versus settling. And this is the question that we're always facing when we look at tools that we want for the shop and we look at the price tag and we're deciding whether or not we should wait and deal with the current solution which may be inefficient frustrating hey brent what up uh not too much is up i'm still waiting for that pdf sketch from you back so i got the specs on that holster mold you want so brent finish sketching it and send it back if rented or needed a tool more than three times a year, it was time to buy it, says Todd May. That may be the case. I think probably for a lot of the holster shops that watch my feed, the bigger consideration is space. And so uh, it can make sense to not buy a tool, even if you could use the tool, and even if the tool would save you money, 
if you don't have space for it. I need a certain amount of free space, otherwise I start feeling claustrophobic in the shop. I just feel cramped and hassled and impacts the quality of my work. Hello, Scott, Black Flag, is anyone checking in? While you're checking in, please share the feed. I appreciate you being here and spending time with me on your Saturday evening. Um, so if you have space constraints, if you're in a one-car garage or you're in your basement or in your spare bedroom or something where you have a very limited amount of space, then you are almost always going to end up giving away additional time because you don't have room to bring in the tools that would buy that time back for you. But the cost of changing space, moving, or adding on is so significant that the, the money and time that that tool would save you might not justify the expense you'd have to make the space to bring that tool in. Jason Cook is here. Hello, Alaska. Thank you for stopping by. Harrison Jones says, spending money on organization devices has proved very helpful for my business. And Ben from 417 Concealment is here. Hello, Ben. Thanks for stopping in. Please share the feed. Um, oftentimes, you can fit more tools in by simply making better use of the space you have. That can be um, accomplished by switching to more vertical storage, uh, using wall space effectively, maximizing the utility of any under bench or under table space. It can also mean throwing out crap that is just hanging around that you don't really need. I threw out a bunch of crap today. I'm going to throw out more crap on Monday and even more crap on Tuesday because now that I got an employee coming in, my whole shop workflow is up for grabs. We'll get to workflow and tooling layout in a minute. But on settling versus saving, um, sometimes this is hard to really get good numbers on. Hello, Scott Jenkins. Thank you for stopping by. My sore throat is finally mostly gone, although I am still drinking some uh, calming herbal tea because my throat was pretty rough this week. Um, so if you have a tool, you know, the difference between I am conflicted about Harbor Freight. Generally, the only kinds of things I buy from Harbor Freight are things that are not power tools at all. If it has no moving parts, I'll consider buying it from Harbor Freight. Like hammers, sledgehammers, I'm okay buying those from Harbor Freight. Um, I don't buy power tools from Harbor Freight, generally. Although I know a lot of guys have had good results, many other guys have also had very poor results. Um, if I had, generally, whenever I can, I try to buy the best tool that I can reasonably afford as long as the price increase, increase is reflected by an increase in quality and durability, which means I can either run the tool harder or have the tool survive for longer with lower maintenance costs. Um, but for a lot of things, like the difference between a $10 broom and a $30 broom for my shop floor, not a big deal. Dustpan, not a big deal. Um, when it comes to you know tooling for a CNC machine, the difference between a $20 end mill and a $100 end mill is usually pretty significant. And if you're cutting a job where that performance matters, either the increased speed means you can get through a big batch of parts in days less time, or the requirements in terms of accuracy or service finish are so high that the cheap tool won't do it for you, but the good one will. Um, I'm always willing to spend a little more on tools and then work harder to make back that money. Um, the times that I've gone cheap and bought a junk tool that bit the dust on me at the worst time or like way soon after I bought it, um, I always end up kicking myself for those things. Uh, so I had a power press heat press. I had several of them, but one of the ones I more recently bought before I got my nice Geonite heat press, um, it had a 30-day warranty. You buy it from Amazon or eBay. It's got a 30-day, I think Amazon is where I bought from, 30-day return policy. And you can buy an optional extended warranty, but if you don't and you go beyond your 30 days and then it bites the dust, you are hosed. And so... The $20 or $30 extended warranty versus the $330 it costs to buy another one is a 
pretty good trade. Honestly, I typically don't buy extended warranties on almost anything. Uh, cheap stuff that heats up, heat press, an expensive heat press. I mean, the price difference between the Geonite press that I have now and the power press, the Geonite press costs four times as much as the power press did. And so, you know, if you're starting out, if you're a small shop, you don't have a lot of sales, uh, or you have limited space and so you're working with very simple tool sets, coming up with an extra $1,000 to spend on a heat press is a major expense. That's a major hurdle. You can do a lot of good work with an inexpensive heat press. Um, tools are not a substitute for skill. They're not a substitute for ingenuity. They're not a substitute for good design. But if you have creativity, if you have ingenuity, if you have a good design, tools are one of the ways that you can execute the design more fully, more quickly, at a higher standard of quality. So uh, currently in my shop, I have many, many more tools than I can keep running by myself. I've got two CNC's, an automated vacuum former, two band saws, three drill presses, a couple of sanders, a buffing wheel, uh, heat press, swift press, CAD computer, table saw, uh, three band saws actually. Um, I have way more tools than I can keep busy. And so one of the things I'm gonna be doing in the next year is hiring more people so the tools that I have are being used consistently. However, and this is going back to a book that I was been reading, I've been reading, Lean for Dummies. Um, um, Aaron Brass says, besides not breaking, does the Geo do anything better than the old one? Aaron, it does two things way better than the old one. First, it actually gives me an accurate temperature reading on the screen. Platin temp versus screen shown temp are actually very close. Second, it gives me extremely even heat. The reason I bought the Geonite is because I looked very carefully into how they actually lay out their heater element, excuse me, in the platen. And they have a much denser array of heat elements, which means that you have much more even coverage. And I can work with different sizes of plastic and never have, which was what I used to have on the power press, I used to have hot spots and cold spots. On the Geonite, hot spots and cold spots are gone. The stuff comes out within a few degrees all over the entire sheet. It's phenomenal. For the kind of vacuum forming I'm doing and the quality of molds that I have, being able to squeeze the last little bit of definition out of the plastic consistently across the entire sheet is a major benefit for me. And so uh, the heat press for me has been a tremendous investment. If my Geonite press died tomorrow, first of all, it would be under warranty and they would replace it for free. Second of all, if for any reason there wasn't, uh, it couldn't be replaced, I would buy another one immediately. Zane, it's only one zone. There's no adjustment of different zones. Did the Geonite cut down on my heat cycle? Uh, not drastically. It improved the quality of my definition. For certain things, it does cut down on my heat cycle. So uh, I was running a bunch of parts today where I used to have to run them at a minute 30 or a minute 40, and now I run them at a minute. Just because the heat is even enough and I can bump the temperature up, 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 up enough. Um, with my power press, I could never really push the temperatures because I had a few hot spots that would scorch. And so I was always limited by those. Brent, mine is a 16 by 20 inch. I have the Geonite K20 heat press. Uh, those hot spots on the power press really were the limiting factor because I couldn't afford to scorch uh, you know, a 14 by 19 sheet of plastic somewhere right in the middle. It would just toast everything. And so I had to always keep my temps low enough that I had no scorching, but I always then would have some cool spots where I never really got the optimal forming temperature. Uh, Aaron, I'm running about 385, 387 for a minute for the parts I was doing today. Um, for some other parts, I run a minute 30, minute 40. On some cases, I run lower temps up to a, like 365 or 370. 
up to a minute 50. It, it really depends on how I'm forming the thing. Um, Zane, 310 before vacuuming. That temp is actually quite low. I usually try to hit 350-ish before I form at a minimum. Um, there really is a, a major difference in the flexibility and elasticity of the plastic from 310 up to 340, 350. It's, it's big. Um, so when it comes to saving versus settling, I default more to the saving up until I can buy the better quality tool. And it also means that I enjoy the tool more once I get it. Because if there's a problem I've been trying to solve or some step that's been frustrating me, and there's a tool I know would solve that problem, would make that step easier, faster, more consistent. Um, if there's a budget version that might do what I want, and there's a better quality tool that I know will do what I want, I will suck it up and deal with the frustration of doing it the stupid slow way a little bit longer to save up the extra money to get the tool that solves the problem correctly. Because what I don't want to do is save, get a little bit impatient, stop saving too soon, and then buy the you know, the half as expensive solution that doesn't actually solve the problem. If I buy a tool and it doesn't solve the problem, it doesn't matter how much or how little I paid for the tool, if it doesn't fix the problem, it's a bad investment. So the bigger, the more important criteria for me, more than cost, is will this consistently do what I want? If it will, then I'm much more flexible on price. If it won't consistently do what I want, then I'm going to keep looking for something else that will. So the power press, heat press, if it was $100, I would not buy another one because it didn't consistently do what I wanted. And the hassle of never knowing for sure what I was going to get every time I opened the heat press, first of all, that's stress in my life I don't need. Second of all, it's impossible to predict how long it'll actually take to run a job. Say I need to make 180 magazine carriers. Well, I know how long 180 heat cycles will take, but I don't know how many of those heat cycles will be good and how many of them will be scrap. And so, you know, it just made it impossible to accurately predict and estimate time involved to complete a project. Thanks, Ben Miller, for watching. I appreciate your time. Have a great night. And so, I err on the side of saving longer, dealing with the frustration of the bad process now a little bit longer, and then buying the best tool I can afford that will solve the problem as completely as possible. Now, workflow and layout. Um, one of the things that Lean for Dummies has talked about a lot is understanding uh, your single piece workflow. How does one part move through your entire production process? and organizing both the people and the, and the machines in the space so that you have the smoothest possible operation with the smallest amount of handling of the parts to go from raw material to finished product. And the reason you want to minimize part handling is it's time, it's extra work, it adds no value. If I spent 20 minutes a day carrying bins of parts around from place to place in my shop, that work adds no value to the parts. It doesn't change them at all. We want to try to eliminate as much as possible any steps that don't add value to the part. Because we want to be able to deliver the finished part and provide great value to the customer and make a good margin ourselves, make a profit, and any extra time, any extra labor costs we incur that don't increase the value of the part, don't improve it, don't change it, uh, that's just, those are just empty calories. It's dead labor. It's cost with no benefit. So my current shop is actually not that well laid out in terms of minimizing handling. The shop layout as it currently sits has basically come about largely by accident based on the order in which I bought my tools. Uh, that's not completely true because I moved nearly this complete shop to this space, 
But as I have bought new tools in this space, their locations in my shop have been, you know, kind of like, well, where can this fit? Shove it over there. And now that I have an employee, going to be starting on Monday, uh, I'm looking long and hard at the exact jobs I intend to have him do and how I can rearrange the shop so that all the things he has to handle and all the things he has to touch are as close to each other as possible to minimize the time he has to spend wandering around finding stuff. I find stuff quickly in my shop. It's my shop. I know where stuff is, and when I set tools down, they don't move because nobody else is in here. But once I have an employee, stuff will start wandering around, and so I'm going to have to do more sort of preventative work in terms of making the layout um, consistent and self-explanatory so that I don't have unnecessary time spent moving around hunting for things. Uh, when it comes to tools, I was talking to Chris Johnson today. He was at Harbor Freight buying some tools with no moving parts based on my recommendation, just some countersinks for deburring holes in Kydex. The same ones I've talked about on my tool tips before, the O flute. Um, let me grab one. Harbor Freight has a set of uh, three of these little guys. This is the medium size. There's a small, medium, and a large. These are great. Uh, I took mine and ground down the tips because they're fairly sharp when you buy them, and I had poked myself a few times, which is not fun. But this is the kind of thing I'm happy to buy from Harbor Freight. These are cheap. Uh, you can get better quality ones that are sharper out of better quality steel from Veritas Tools from Lee Valley. But for plastic work, these ones from Harbor Freight are great. Eight bucks for the set, says Chris Johnson. Eight bucks for three of them. So I told him to buy two sets. He's like, okay, if you say so, I'll buy two sets. And the reason to buy two sets is not because you're going to break them and not because they're going to get dull. You can, easily, you can easily resharpen this with a chainsaw file. Not hard. Done it many times. The reason to buy two sets is because you're going to misplace them or lose them, and you want to be able to leave them in the place in the shop where you use them most. Scott Jenkins says, specific jobs, specific tools, each station. That's exactly what I was driving at, Scott. Um, if I have two different places in the shop where I do assembly, I will have two complete sets of the drills, drivers, bits, whatever I need, and hardware trays at those two locations. Uh, my little deburring tools that I use, I've got four or five of them around the shop now because I never want to have to go wandering around to some other spot in the shop to find one. I now have one, two, three, four, five, six uh, cordless drill drivers around the shop. Four Hitachis, two Boshes. Seven. Four Hitachis, three Boshes. Because I don't want to have to go walking across the shop to find something. I just have, I have a couple over at my assembly bench. I have a couple over here. I've got one over by the drill press because I want to have one basically within arm's reach. I don't want to be hunting for it. And once the employee is in, if we need similar tools at the same time, I don't want to have to be taking turns. So you will buy. Hi, Patrick. I will start now. Uh, once you share the feed, then I'll start. Um, so I buy multiples of a lot of commonly used tools in my shop. I, uh, I have two spare in-box vacuum pumps that I'm not using currently. Uh, I've got a spare Robin Air 15800, and I've got a spare 12 CFM one that I bought. Uh, it's the one that Matt from FFR Holsters and Clark Trost are using. Uh, Clark recommended it to me, so I went ahead and grabbed one. A couple hundred bucks, but it's a spare vacuum pump that I, that I now have in the shop. If for any reason one of my existing pumps went down, I'm not even having to wait for prime. I can just go pull the spare vacuum pump out, plumb it in, be right back up and running. The, the amount of time that I save by spending tying up that little bit of money right now and the peace of mind of knowing that if, I break, if I'm on a tight deadline and my vacuum pump dies on a Saturday afternoon, I'm not waiting till Tuesday because if I order on Prime, it's going to ship Monday and arrive Tuesday. I'm not waiting on Prime. I can just get out the spare tool, plug it in, be off and running. If my drill press went down, got a spare. Bandsaw goes down, got a spare. If the CNC goes down, I'm out of luck until the repairman can get here. 
But for critical tools, having a spare is worthwhile unless they're, you know, unless they're cripplingly expensive and or you don't have space to store them. Uh, redundancy is a big help and it's peace of mind knowing you can push hard. Bandsaw blades always have multiple spares, not just one. So if I break one and throw my spare on, I've still got a spare for my spare if I do something stupid and break that fresh blade the same day. Um, so for me, I look at what steps will this tool eliminate? What other advantages will it bring in the shop? Will it be cleaner to use? Will it be quieter to use? Is it faster? Does it actually eliminate steps? Does it allow me to get rid of some other less efficient tool that I currently have and don't like using? Um, will it make it more likely that my employee can consistently complete that job without making mistakes? Um, Lean for Dummies talks about not using the term idiot proofing, but using the term error proofing. And I think that's good because we all make mistakes and I make a lot of mistakes. And when I'm talking to an employee and teaching them how to do something, I want to as much as possible make it difficult for them to make errors. I want to provide a process that's straightforward enough, clear enough, simple enough that it's basically error proof. It has nothing to do with them being an idiot or not. I want to try to head off at the pass the potential mistakes they would make and just prevent them from happening. Uh, and so I have space in my current job. I've got 1,200 square feet. Uh, it's, it's fairly full, but I've got a decent amount of floor space. And if I work the layout effectively and add some more vertical storage because I've got some unused wall space, I can certainly get, um, I can certainly get more stuff in here without ending up being cramped. Do I use Islet Cezanne? Yes, I do. I do not have an automated machine. I'm still using an Arbor Press. Works just fine for me. Hello, Nathaniel Baker. I'm guessing it's Nathaniel. I'm guessing it's not Amelia. But if it's Amelia, hello, Amelia. Um, so when I'm looking at buying tools, do I have space for it? Do I have money for it? What will it get me? What will it cost me? Do I expect to have a long period of time before it's up and running and saving me time and money? Or is it a straightforward, self-explanatory tool that as soon as I buy it, it I'll be able to, to utilize the benefit immediately? Um, there are lots and lots of little, inexpensive tools and hacks that can save time and hassle in every shop. This is one of the reasons why I advocate going and visiting other holster maker shops because you'll find little things that they have that you would never have thought to do, but as soon as you see them, you're like, wow, I should do that. That's a great idea. I should totally have one of those right next to my drill press so I never have this whatever problem again or so that I can always do that thing super fast like he does it. That's a great idea. I should get one of those. So I'm always fascinated to go into anybody else's shop and see all the little things, little purpose-built tools, the way they have workstations organized, because I can glean useful information from that, even if that exact setup, you know, the one that they have, if it wouldn't be a perfect fit for my shop, there may still be some element of it or some principle to how it's organized that is applicable to my shop and will save me time and hassle. Maybe I will, Patrick Rorman. Maybe I will come visit. Uh, I actually was talking to Nehemiah Bailey today about stopping in and visiting his shop because he's less than two hours from me. He's up in Indianapolis, and I've never stopped in and seen him, and he's never stopped in and seen me. So uh, one of these times, I'm just going to crash his shop and do a little Facebook Live broadcast from the Cry Havoc Gear workshop. My whole process has been turned upside down, still trying to get used to switching to vacuum, says Dean Kennedy. Well, the Kennedy Co., uh, I hope you're enjoying it. I found it immensely exciting when my process got flipped upside down and I ditched foam and went to vacuum. Now, um, I saw Plan B publishing some videos of using half-inch thick foam in place of a silicone membrane, uh, using it like, a, like you would use a Swift press, using it just with a frame, just a loose piece of foam. Um, and a lot of guys seem interested by it. I understand. It looks like it provides nice definition. Um, the foam is probably not 
as expensive as the silicone membranes are, but the trade-off is the foam still, excuse me, the foam still prevents you from cooling the parts as effectively. You're saving plastic, you have to go a little slower in lining the plastic up to make sure you've got good coverage, and then you have this, you have to leave the stuff under vacuum for longer to get it to cool. Hey, Rick Wayne, I feel like I haven't seen you in a while. Welcome. Did you get a Herco VM10? Do you have that now? If you do, I'm super excited. Oliver loves playing. Well, he's constantly experimenting with stuff, and that's great. Oftentimes, you don't know how well something works until you try it. And some of the things he's tried are probably like, eh, well, that was fun to have tried, not worth doing again. Which is the same thing as a lot of the things I've tried. It's like, well, that was fun. I'm not going to do it again. Didn't, didn't really benefit me much. Um, but I think contrary to what many of you think, I don't have any kind of principle about wasting plastic. I, I just don't. To me, more waste is a cost. It's a downside. I only, I'm only interested in wasting more plastic if wasting that plastic buys me such an increase in speed that the cost of the wasted plastic is more than covered by the labor and time I'm saving by going faster. But wasting anything is not a virtue. I don't get excited to waste plastic. It's still, when I take a big box full of plastic pre-cut scraps from my vacuum forming process. When I take those outside and fill up my big trash can, uh, yes, Dean, I have seen what you're doing with the membrane. I like it. Personally, I don't ever do that because nothing that I do um, really stands to benefit from going slightly, like two steps forward, one step back and putting a membrane on my Swift press. But my OEM stuff is almost always black. And so I'm just not dealing with, I'm not dealing with Cryptex. I'm not dealing with tactical infusions prints. I'm not dealing with a lot of the things where saving, uh, saving the waste matters more because the plastic is more expensive. But uh, I'm agnostic when it comes to plastic waste. It doesn't matter to me either way I'm happy to give away plastic to buy time, provided that giving away the plastic buys me enough time to pay for the plastic plus some. Hello, Justin Garner. I am super excited to see that 17 frame. Can't wait. Um, vacuum quadruples waste for you, says Patrick Rohrman. Yeah, Patrick, so when people start talking about percentages, um, a big percentage of a very small number is still a very small number. Like if I was, well, Patrick, I've seen how you're, how you're doing yours with, with your uh, pre-folding, islanding, and then using a flat iron to heat it up and put your knife in and then press it. And that makes, that makes great sense for that kind of neck knife sheath. Um, Vacuum forming does not quadruple waste for me. So, real quick. Doing a little quick math here. So Harrison Jones says a 12 by 12 sheet is $4. The waste is worth the time. Dan Harris says, listen, I was on that ship about hating the excess waste. Then after making one holster on a thrift press, I'm about to waste a lot of plastic. So if you're doing 8 by 8 squares and you're using a membrane former, you're using, you know, you're using 64 square inches of plastic um, per holster. 
if I'm doing two holsters in a 10 by 16, I'm using 80 square inches of plastic per holster. Okay, going from 64 to 80 square inches of plastic, if you actually calculate the cost of a square inch of plastic, it's not very much. It's just not very much. And so, um, yeah, if I'm spending an extra dollar in plastic, but I'm saving myself time, it, it almost always is going to come out more in my favor. So, Patrick, you say you're still going to make the change, but it's not going to make you faster. It just makes it easier for somebody else to do. Guess what? If I can set up my process such that I can have an employee that I'm paying $12 an hour do all the vacuum forming for me, no matter how fast I would have gone doing it, it's still way cheaper to have that person doing it because my labor costs me a lot more than $12 an hour. So setting up steps in the process to make it easier for somebody else to do them for you is major. Um, and if you're doing prints occasionally, it's easy with a thrift press to just buy a membrane, lay it over your sheet, and drop your frame around it, just like the Kennedy Co., just like Dean Kennedy is doing. So it's not the case. Um, no 10 by 10s or 12 by 12s with the flags. Dean, I don't know. I've not gone shopping for printed plastics, but I bet you could find them if you really wanted them. Um, so those are my thoughts on, uh, hey, Chris, thank you for stopping in, CNG Holsters. Uh, I'm about to sign off, but please do share the feed while you're still here and I'm still here. Um, when it comes to layout and workflow, try to organize the workflow in your shop so that material, raw material comes in and gets stored in a logical place where you're not like, bringing it in the door, carrying it all the way to the far corner of the shop to store it, bringing it back to the side to cut it, taking it back over there to form it, back over here to buff it, and then over there to ship and package it, and then back over here to put it out the door. Um, obviously, a linear workflow where parts come in, raw material comes in, and each next station that it needs is the next one in line. Um, that will save you a significant amount of time, but you won't necessarily feel it right away just because you're probably not aware of the extra time you waste in the shop currently wandering around. If your shop is tiny, like John Hoffman's shop is tiny, um, he has very little transit time involved. My shop's a lot bigger. I've got more transit time involved. And so anything I can do to rearrange, to minimize, you know, whatever things I use the most often should all be really close together. The things that I use occasionally can be farther away because I'm going to travel to them less often. Um, as my employee settles in here and we rearrange the shop and around his workflow and make sure things are comfortable for him, I'm probably going to end up buying extras of some of the smaller hand tools and things that I keep around in single right now just so that he has a copy and doesn't need to come hunting for mine and so that I don't have to go across the workshop to his space and find one if I need it for five minutes. So, man, I am tired. It's been a long week. Uh, I got to fire this guy back up and do a little bit more work on him tonight. So, thank you guys very much for stopping by. I appreciate your time. If you have other questions about tools or thinking through what tools to buy, if you have particular questions about which things to get next and about how much money to spend on them, I'm happy to talk to you guys about that kind of stuff. Uh, shoot me a DM on Instagram or an email, orders at henryholsters.com, or send me a text, 812-369-2266. So thank you guys very much for stopping by. I appreciate your time, and hope you guys have a great night. I'll see you guys next week. When, we, uh, when I pick up next week and the employee is in the shop, there's going to start being more live content 
during the workday. I'll still do my Facebook Live broadcast like this in the evening, probably going to stick to 9 p.m. Eastern because that time seems to work well for a lot of people. But um, there's going to be more stuff on Instagram Live during the day. So if you don't already follow Henry Holsters on Instagram, follow me there. And if you want to know when I'm doing live stuff, make sure to turn on notifications for my page. Um, and so what I'm, what I'm hoping to do is a couple times each day, pop into Instagram Live for a couple of minutes and show you guys what I'm working on, what Eric's working on, whatever's going on in the shop. Pidcasts, podcasts. Yeah, Aaron, the podcast is still coming. I haven't gotten through all the hurdles to actually get it um, through iTunes and that kind of stuff. So it's, it's on the back burner. Getting stuff ready for the employee to come in was a higher priority than uh, spending time on the podcast right now. So it'll be up. It'll happen soon. Uh, definitely still going to happen. So if you're not following me on Instagram, follow me there. That's where I post the most current stuff. And Instagram live videos are a uh, live only. So if you don't watch while it's live, you can't go back and watch it later. So um, sort of the incidental stuff going on in the shop that's not necessarily uh, worth archiving long term is going to be the kind of stuff that I will quickly shoot on Instagram live. So keep an eye out for that. Have a great night, guys. I will talk to you all next week.